It's not quite enough to house people, but uh, when people have stable housing, that's in fact the very beginning towards building a sense of community, a sense of belonging. It is a, um, a nice warm evening and I'm glad that you were able to attend tonight. It's a privilege to be here in this beautiful, historic and iconic Boston building to talk about a subject near and dear to me and the rest of the panelists and that's housing. I'd like to take a few minutes for each of the panelists to introduce themselves and talk about the kind of housing that they've developed and are working on. So the first person is Christine. I'm going to pass that to you. Sure. Thanks, Donna. Um, I'm Christine Clements. I'm an architect. I'm a resident of the North End and a member of, actually at Old North here. Um, um, my architectural professional career was really all in commercial and um, hospital educational development, um, not really in residential. But I did see a lot of uh, residential construction going on, especially in the city of Boston, that was large, luxury condo buildings um, that was frankly dismaying to me because um, I don't think that's providing the housing that people need to live in. Um, so what I have become involved in is a concept called co-housing, which is, um, my, my soundbite for it is B-Y-O-N, build your own neighborhood. It's a, a um, way of building um, neighborhood housing by the people who will live there. And um, uh, my own project, uh, Bay State Commons, um, is an example of that, that I hope I get to talk about later. Um, but that's my introduction. Uh, do you want us to talk about like, where one project right now? Sure. Or, sure, okay. So I'm Angie Liu, and I'm the executive director of the Asian Community Development Corporation. So we are primarily based in Boston's Chinatown. And the work we do includes uh, three program areas. Um, the largest one involves uh, building and preserving affordable housing. And through that, um, the housing work, uh, we recognize the housing is an important foundation for uh, to be able to thrive and succeed in other ways. Um, so we use housing as a platform to strengthen uh, our communities and empower families. Um, so I think all of you have got the handouts. Um, so there's some graphics there that gives you an idea of the type of housing that we do. Um, and it's a project called One Greenway that uh, we completed a couple years ago in the heart of Chinatown. So that's a very good example of um, the type of large scale um, transformative project um, that we have been able to accomplish in Chinatown. Um, Chinatown, uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, it has a lot of challenges, um, not a lot of land, and a lot of um, gentrification. So whenever we get to develop a piece of land, such as on this one, we um, try to work with um, market rate developers in order to leverage the resources that they're bringing in order to achieve a lot of affordability. Um, so I'm not going to go into a ton of details about that, but on handouts you can kind of get an idea of the type of housing um, and answer the urban environment in which it's in. Um, and that project includes um, some open spaces and community spaces as well. Thank you. My name is Ray Rumpfenauer. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, and uh, I kind of came to housing through an unusual path. I was living uh, as an artist and a resident of a building called Midway Studios, which was put on the market for sale in 2014. And myself and a number of other residents who lived in the building organized an effort to purchase the building, and we raised $20 million of financing in a very short period to be able to acquire it um, with the goal of stabilizing rents but also in creating an investment fund that the residents who lived in the building could invest in and therefore actually have an ownership stake, uh, voting for the board of directors of the building, being able to help shape the trajectory of the building and the goals that it would have, 
but also to be able to know that they would continue to be able to operate their businesses and their artistic practices in Fort Point, which has historically been a neighborhood where many artists have been able to live and work, but in recent years has been under a lot of economic pressure to the artist community as development activity has taken place. And so as a result of this, um, I've become very passionate about artist housing generally, um, but also artist housing in the city of Boston and um, working with the city and with developers to, to really design projects that um, can not just be apartment buildings that artists live in, but rather you know, artistic communities that really address all of the artistic concerns, but also the work implications, the living implications, and what it means to be a, a kind of arts neighborhood community within, within a building and within a larger district. Raver, I was going to start with you. We're going to cover a couple of topics tonight. Um, the two major topics are architecture and design and cultural identity and gentrification, which I think some of our speakers have mentioned a little bit already. So we're going to start off with architecture and design, and we have a, a few questions on that topic, and I'll ask each of you to answer the question with a couple of minutes um, response. So the first question is, what specific design choices promote community in your type of housing? So Raber, if you could start talking about artist housing and how you promote community for artists specifically in that type of housing. Um, so one of the challenges with artist housing is that, um, particularly in the case of artist work live housing, is that the, the housing is a place where artists work, but it's also a place where they live. And so it's a very unique um, sort of typology. And particularly given that artists have so many diverse needs and diverse disciplines, um, there's a whole set of architectural challenges that occur when you're, when you're trying to develop um, a, a meaningful, sustainable artist community. So as an example, woodworkers might generate a lot of noise because of the equipment that they use to, to fabricate their, their, their art. Um, whereas other artists who are maybe working in music also generate noise but are very sensitive to noise. And so in order to really build a community, everybody has to feel as though they have a home there and that they're welcome there and that their, that their art is not something uh, which is really an extension of their ability to, to have a livelihood and ability to be able to make money. Um, they have to be able to feel like they can live there and work there effectively. And so through a lot of the designs that we have uh, developed, we do this in a few ways. Um, one is by the way in which the workspace is distributed within the building, and one is through policies. Um, when workspace is usually consolidated, as an example, you know, to one side of the building, you can address architecturally a lot of solutions, noise mitigation, ceiling height, special ventilation that is needed for some artistic disciplines that can make sure that those, those functions are really protected. Um, and through policies like being able to have uh, flexibility when it comes to moving internally within the building so that people whose uh, needs change over time or as they you know, have families or perhaps children move on, they can move internally within the building from a, a, a larger unit to a smaller unit or vice versa. So um, the housing that um, we primarily build in Chinatown, we, we know what our target audience is because we know that when we're building the housing in Chinatown, a, a big uh, purpose is to try to make sure that um, low-income immigrant families um, have the opportunity to stay in their community. And so um, these do come through the design choices that we make. Um, so some of them, um, in terms of the demographics, um, from even where we choose a site, we know that a lot of um, the low and moderate income families, they actually don't drive, or um, the car ownership is actually very low, and there's a very high reliance on the T. So we always want to make sure that it's a very convenient walk to um, any of the T stations. And Chinatown is small enough that um, pretty much anywhere within that um, area, um, you can achieve that um, walkability and close to transit and amenities. Um, the other thing that we uh, take into account of is unlike a lot of the market rate housing that is built today that tends to focus on 
um, a lot of studios, ones or two bedrooms. We know that um, in our immigrant communities, um, especially in the Asian community, um, there are a lot more um, multi-generational multi -generational families um, with grandparents living together with um, their adult children and grandkids. So we focus a lot more on twos and three bedrooms and sometimes even four bedrooms. So that's a conscious decision that we make. Um, and one of the things that um, I remember, um, you know, our, some of our old time board members tell us um, before urban renewal came um, through Chinatown in the 50s and 60s and took away a lot of the row houses, they remember um, the community used to be very tight knit because there were eyes on the street, right? So as children, they would play on the streets but there was always someone's auntie or somebody's mom looking at a window, looking at a stoop saying, it's time to go home, what are you doing? Are you home for dinner? And so we tried to recreate some of that um, through design. So um, in our buildings, we always make sure that there is um, communal spaces that can um, create space for people to come together. So it, it's a very flexible community room that can uh, function as a, you know, for, for birthday parties, for gatherings, and that's connected um, to a children's playroom. And the children's playroom is also connected with the laundry room, and a laundry room has a see-through window, a glass panel, so that when parents are doing laundry, they can actually wash their children um, if they are in the playroom. So we try to incorporate a lot of that um, into the building design um, to really think about um, it's not quite enough to house people, but uh, when people have stable housing, that's in fact the very beginning towards building a sense of community, a sense of belonging. That's great, thanks. Um, the co-housing model of building housing is, um, it was actually a little background. It was um, uh, as a way to provide both private homes and a neighborly community life was, um, began in Denmark about 50 years ago, um, where in Denmark now about 2% of, of their total population lives in, in some form of, of co-housing. In the early 1980s, architects uh, Katie McCammon and Charles Durrett did their graduate research in, in Denmark and brought that um, concept back to the United States. Um, and now in the US there are um, 160 uh, communities across the nation, 125 of them in development. And the, the population that is attracted to co-housing is uh, basically middle class uh, families, single people, older retired people, people who um, want to live in the kind of community that Angie just described, where there are eyes on the street, where you know your neighbors, where everybody knows your name, uh, old Boston uh, favorite. And uh, the design um, uh, approaches to that do involve a lot of uh, community, common space, um, balanced against individual private units. Um, typically, um, co-housing projects, they, they generally range from 20 to 35 households. Um, they are created by, like I said, the, the people who are gonna live there come together, make a financial investment to finance and develop the project themselves, and make all the decisions about how that will be built. So if we want wood shops, um, music rooms, swimming pool, any of those things, um, they're a community decision on what gets included in the, the whole project. Um, if we wanna have guest rooms so that you don't need an extra bedroom in your own unit because there's a place for your visitors to sleep. Um, uh, common space for a large community meal is a very important part of almost all co-housing um, projects that are successful anyway because uh, sharing a meal together is a primary way of building a sense of community. Um, the, the eyes on the street, um, another design feature that's um, very important in co-housing development is 
um, orienting people's front doors so that they face onto the pathway that you take from when you arrive from work or school or the T to your front door. Other people in their, at their kitchen sink are seeing who's coming home, can see the kids out of play. Um, I think another uh, important design uh, feature is, is, is really that pathway from your car to your front door and the way that that happens in a lot of um, standard American suburban development is you drive into your garage and you come right up inside and you could, you could live an entire lifetime in a neighborhood and not know the people in your neighborhood. That's, um, that, that loss of community is what drives people to, uh, uh, to want to join a co-housing group. Our next question is how do you approach the design of a new building or the preservation of an older building to fit into the current neighborhood context. And I think all of us, in, in Boston at least, and in Massachusetts, there's always an extensive public approval process to develop anything, and especially housing. So I think if you can each answer the question, thinking about that process, but also just how your organization manages that process or prepares for that process of public approval and fitting into the context of an existing neighborhood? So. Uh, that's actually a real challenge because um, um, our, my particular group has been in a very lengthy um, uh, slog to win public approval of our, our project. Um, a lot of that has to do with existing zoning laws and regulations, um, limits on density, setback requirements, parking requirements. Um, our group, likewise, has very low car usage, but we are required to provide um, one parking space for every bedroom. Um, that, that's hard when you have multi-bedroom uh, units. Um, the, uh, I think one of the answers to that is something that we've actually managed to do over the course of, of working on our project. And in, in co-housing, we talk about uh, the, uh, we build the human community first before we build the building. And over the course of working on our 30 unit, multifamily, multi-generational uh, project, we have uh, investor members from young single people, older retired people, young families, multi-generation families, um, uh, single parents. Um, over the course of developing that, uh, we have made so many connections within the community we're looking to build in that we've managed to mobilize amazing turnout at some of these public hearings and, uh, and influence the decisions that are made by, by the agencies. That's not easy, but, um, and we're still, we're still working on it, but uh, the fact that, that uh, we have that kind of support, I think speaks to how hard we've worked to build community, which is kind of the point. One of the points of, of uh, living in a strong community is that, um, that we are engaged. We are uh, participating in the, the life of the community around us. We, have, um, we are gonna be voters in our, in our uh, new home for sure. And, and our, uh, the city council and the elected officials, they already know us. So um, it, 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 it is a real community building process. Sure. Um, I think Chinatown is a little bit unique because um, I do hear a lot of uh, neighborhoods where um, in trying to design a new building and make it fit into the existing urban fabric um, or neighborhood context, I'm trying to win the support of neighbors and abutters is a real uphill battle. Um, so in Chinatown, because of its proximity to the financial district, to downtown, to South Station, um, it is surrounded by high density. It is surrounded by a lot of high rises already, a lot of commercial uses, office buildings. Um, and so Chinatown itself is not necessarily adverse to 
a lot of big, tall buildings. Um, and what I see in Chinatown, um, which does not always happen in other neighborhoods, is one of the first things um, residents will ask is, um, if you're proposing a large building, and let's say it's going uh, significantly uh, above what the current laws and zoning regulations permits, what are you bringing? What do you bring to the neighborhood? And the number one issue that we continually hear over and over again is affordability, affordable housing. So if it's a housing project, um, are you going above and beyond even what the city of Boston requires in terms of affordable housing? And residents are very savvy about, um, you know, even when you say you're going to provide a lot of affordable housing, who is it affordable to? Because it's a very different thing to say. It's affordable to, um, you know, a, a, a you know, twenty-something-year-old single worker um, versus um, an, an immigrant family, first-generation parents who are working in restaurant jobs. That's very different. Um, and so for our agency's own project, um, I mean, that is our mission to build as much affordable housing as possible. Um, so we, we are always um, walking this fine line between balancing um, having to maximize the limited amount of land that we have in Chinatown. Because remember, physically, Chinatown is a very small neighborhood. We're landlocked. Um, so whenever we have a development opportunity, we try to maximize what we can do there. Um, and what we also try to do is to make sure that we're bringing, bringing in a lot of community benefits, um, a lot of community spaces and affordable housing. So for example, um, the project that we are currently developing, which hopefully will start construction in two years, um, we're talking about 100% um, affordable housing plus the possibility of a new Chinatown branch of the library uh, on the ground floor. So that's a significant community benefit that uh, the neighborhood can rally around. I, I think the challenge as it relates um, to the type of housing that we are focused on with, with artist housing is that um, <coughs> There is a tendency in the development of new projects to try to bring into the, uh, the building many things that people have an aspiration to have in the context of, of the neighborhood. Um, but you could sort of say that there's a fork in the development process where um, even though the city has a pretty rigorous uh, procedure for um, public meetings and, and disclosure, um, I think a lot of people end that process feeling um, like they haven't really been able to make an impact on the final design. And so I think our challenge is finding ways to be able to integrate uh, that input, garner that input in a way that's meaningful early enough on that it can really shape the design. And then making sure that you're checking back in to, to make sure that those assumptions that you've made along the way haven't drifted along, along the way of the process. Um, because it's quite natural that as a project is being developed and being designed, um, a lot of different forces are at work and come at play, and things that are aspirational at the beginning can begin to slide sideways and you don't actually achieve the goals of them. Um, and I think the other piece is that uh, you can be much more effective in uh, building partnerships within the neighborhood than you can in trying to take on the responsibility for a single development project to cure a whole bunch of, of, of requests. So a, a granular example of this is that if you're doing a new building, for example, that is focused on arts, rather than building a facility that is within the building for a specific purpose, how can you support someone else who has that ambition in the neighborhood? Can you partner with them? Can you use part of the money that you are generating from the market rate units in your building to support their efforts? Because the likelihood that that effort is already sort of organic or grassroots or has been sort of incubating for a long time is probably quite high by the time that it lands in your lap. And um, it's really much better because it then opens up an opportunity for you to maybe use that space in a different way to further another vision or, or a different ambition. And you can 
in doing that, make a partner and there can be some reciprocity so that your uh, so the neighborhood and someone who has perhaps had an ambition to open a wood shop or an ambition to convert a garage into a metal shop um, or is a garage that is working on, uh, you know, uh, kind of industrial fabrication things during the day, but in the evening hours can be used for a different purpose. Those tend to be much more optimized, efficient partnerships for us uh, than in trying to take on everything individually. Um, and I think just philosophically, it's a much more appealing way to, to, to work. So we're going to segue to our next topic, which is cultural identity and then gentrification. So the first question is, how is cultural identity and community belonging reinforced by your type of housing? And not just from the design perspective, but from the way that it's run. Um, Christine? Uh, well, uh, the, the identity of, of a co-housing community is the people who choose to come together to, to make that happen. And uh, that, that's, it is, because it is uh, financed and developed by the people who are going to be living there, uh, there are some inherent financial limitations to that. Uh, we all have aspirations for affordability because it's our homes and we're buying them um, and we want to be able to uh, make that available to people of a wide range of of uh, life situations, uh, but in the end, because we are building it, we don't have government support or nonprofit support. Uh, we, it costs what it costs. We buy the land, we hire all the consultants, the contractor, the lawyers, the accountants. Everything that goes into developing a building adds up to a number at the bottom, and you divide by the number of units, and those are your costs. Um, so. While we have aspirations to make some units affordable, we can only do that by increasing everyone else's cost to offset those. That's just the way that the numbers work out. So um, the identity comes from the people and what they choose to do. We some some. Uh, some communities organize around a, a very specific uh, thing. Some are senior um, co-housing communities who are 55 plus and looking for a way to uh, have an active and engaged third act to their lives and rather than focus on uh, raising children. But uh, multifamily uh, communities like, like mine are, are welcoming to um, large families want to have kids running around and so that the identity arises from that and from uh, the community that we that we choose to to build in i just want to clarify yep it's it's a little challenging with one mic that we have to pass around because we can't really chat and have a conversation but i wanted to to ask angie if you could touch on the, the whole issue of culture and community and Chinatown specifically, but also when you're doing a mixed income development, how do you combine those two things? The, the people who might be wealthier and, and not from a, a Chinese American background or Asian background, and, and how do those communities have an opportunity to come together? Sure, uh, so I can um, try to speak to that. So one of the really interesting statistics about Chinatown that I always like to share um, is that if you look at the last two uh, census from 2000 to 2010, and I think the 2020 census next year will bear this trend out as well, is that the Asian population in Chinatown has been decreasing over the years. We've been steadily losing the Asian population through a series of factors. Um, so including the urban renewal that happened about half a century ago that took a lot of the housing away from Chinatown, um, coupled with uh, the gentrification of rising housing costs in Chinatown um, that's pushed a lot of people out. Um, so although the overall population uh, has increased in Chinatown, the reality is the longtime residents are uh, uh, steadily uh, being pushed out. And so 
when we think about our housing work, it's in that context of th there's a very physical problem of how do we make sure that um, longtime residents and families can continue to have um, safe and stable affordable housing that they can live in Chinatown. Um, the other part is um, the more intangible part of how do we make sure that this continues um, to stay as a, a genuine um, eth ethnic uh, neighborhood that has um, all the unique culture that um, it does not become an empty shell because once all the residents move out, at some point, it just becomes a Disney-fied version of a Chinatown, right? So maybe people might come in and eat the food and, and go out, but if there's really no one living there anymore, um, it's not a genuine community. Um, so a lot of the work that we have been doing over the last two years actually is how do we support our residents to make sure that they build a sense of community and to um, assert a sense of uh, identity. So a lot of the work that we've been doing is actually programming in outdoor public spaces. Um, we've actually been um, working with a couple of local artists and residents, and they've been doing um, a series of really exciting outdoor projects um, on the edges of Chinatown to really try to um, empower that sense of community in, uh, in outdoor public Realm. Um, the other problem that you refer to, Donna, um, is something that we're still grappling with. This idea of you have new residents and old residents living together in the community. How do we come, how do they come together? So um, we have found that the most effective and easiest way so far is again through the idea of engaging through um, ours and public spaces. Um, so here I'm actually going to make a little plug. Um, on Hudson Street in Chinatown, um, this week, weekend we're having a little kickoff. So uh, we've actually taken over an empty lot on Hudson Street for the last couple months and converted it into a community garden. But it's much more than a community garden. Uh, there are actually artists and residents working a couple of temporary um, installations there. And that seems to be an easy way for people to get engaged. Whether, whether you are a, because we have new residents and old res residents participating in that project. And it seems to be a very non-threatening, easy way to have that conversation, right? Because it can be very con contentious to set up conversations like, you're a newcomer, you're a gentrifier, and, and you're displacing me. And that's a hard spot to be. I think as it uh, relates specifically um, to the cultural identity of, of, um, of artists, you know, at least as it relates to the projects that we're working on, there's kind of a cultural identity, but then there's also a functional identity. And the functional identity um, is really organized around a set of values that everyone can, can you know, share. And it's, it's actually sort of not hard to get at it. I mean, we usually hold meetings and ask people what it is that they value and then try to make sure that the budget is reflective of those values. And I think that that is part of where sometimes we see a disconnect, is that there's a lot of expression of values and things that are important, but the budgets don't reflect that same value set. And so for us, it's really about trying to make sure that those values are preserved over time and that new members of the community are um, educated both formally and informally about the history of the neighborhood, the history about the, the community that is there, um, how it is that the benefits that they're enjoying have been, in certain cases, hard fought by their predecessors and the way in which they can be the stewards of those benefits moving forward to ensure that they're gonna be preserved for, for future generations of artists. Um, one of the things that's very unique about um, Midway Artist Studios, for example, is that it's a rental building. And it's a rental building where the residents who are renting uh, studios in that building have the same privileges that you would have if you were in a co-op or a condominium, in that you are allowed to elect the board of directors to the mm -hmm. nonprofit entity that owns the building. You benefit from the financial appreciation of the building because as the building appreciates and is refinanced over time, 
those savings are translated into rent savings because we only raise rents to the extent necessary to support operating the building. And uh, you also guide the direction of the building by virtue of your elected representatives, but also by uh, your own advocacy for various projects within the building. So an example is that um, you know, a lot of residents feel very strongly and quite rightly so about having a real commitment to uh, solar panels and to solar power within the, uh, within the project. And so we're um, in the process of engaging a number of efforts to explore uh, doing an entirely sort of self-sustained electrical power grid on the roof through solar panels. That's the kind of initiative that in the context of a, of a, of a, of a building where the rental residents did not vote for the board of directors, that they could make that type of request as a residence association, but it could very well stop at the ownership board level if that's not one of the values of, the, um, of whoever owns the building. Um, and so that's an example of where you try to make sure that the values that people express um, both directly and indirectly as part of formal processes and anecdotal um, interactions are then carried out sort of on an annual basis in budgets and then translated into real outcomes because then that starts to become sort of self-perpetuating. People see that and then they model that example and then they get excited and inspired and say, oh, well, we could do this project, we could do that project, and it begins to sort of snowball on itself. So our, our next question is um, on the perception of exclusion. So while these, all these developments are trying to develop a sense of community, there's also the challenge inherent in that in, in not excluding others. And I know in the affordable housing world, we are highly regulated around how we market affordable housing to ensure that there isn't discrimination. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you deal with the, the concept of exclusion, somebody who's not an artist or who's not able to, to be part of the community. How do you involve all the community members in co-housing to empower them to be part of a discussion about how the place is run? Because um, I don't think we've talked much about the governance part of co-housing. And I think there are a lot of similarities in, in the way we operate. Um, for example, with community development corporations like Asian CDC in South Boston and DC, we have boards of directors that are elected from, the, from a membership that is based on the people who live in the neighborhood. And anyone who is over 18 can be a member of South Boston Neighborhood Development Corporation and vote for the members of the board. So if you can speak to that in co-housing and also in um, that idea of exclusion and community um, and how it relates to how you've built your housing, but also how, in, in your case, Angie and Raber, your developments have been around for quite a while now, so how has that played out over time. So I'll start with Christine. Sure, um, it actually goes to things that you mentioned, Raver mentioned about uh, values and uh, policies also. And the um, aspect of co-housing I, I didn't really get to mention is how uh, we agree to operate as an organization. Um, it, all co-housing groups um, uh, operate on a consensus decision-making process. Um, some of the guiding principles are self-selection of members. There's no uh, criteria. If you want to join co-housing and, and you can afford to buy in, we'd love to have you. Um, as long as you're willing to participate in the consensus decision-making process. That's how um, all the decisions get made. So it's not a separate board of directors uh, that is elected or operates on a strict voting um, uh, basis. It is, we work on, and this is one of the reasons it takes so long, we work um, on decisions until everyone is comfortable with it, which is a process that when I first joined the group, I thought, that is never gonna work. Um, and I have been amazed, um, actually. It, it's, not, it's not quick, but I, I've, I've been amazed at the, um, the kind of decisions that come out of that process when you take the time to go through and make sure that everyone's concerns have been heard, that everyone's been uh, respectfully listened to, 
and the, the group as a whole starts to, to operate in a way that they arrive at a decision that, that everyone can live with. And a commitment to, to working that way is, is a core part of, of the co-housing program. We work with a lot of uh, facilitators and training on how to do that, active listening, um, nonviolent communication, consensus decision making, um, a, a lot of work on, on exactly that. Um, so the, it goes a little also to the, the, the culture and, and the, the hope for um, appealing to a wide um, uh, market of people we don't want to. We don't want to be a, a bunch of identical, like-minded people living together. And uh, as long as as long as you're willing to, to work with us, um, we we do have uh, quite a bit of diversity of opinion. I'll say that. I always like to remind people that um, Chinatown is the way it is, and the reason we have um, Chinatowns all across the country is remember um, the history of immigration in this country. Um, wasn't always a pretty one. Um, when the first Chinese um, arrived in the 19th century, they weren't welcome in most of the places. So where they congregated um, were often run down uh, neighborhoods that no one else wanted to be in. And that's the genesis of uh, Boston's Chinatown as well. Um, coupled with the Chinese Exclusion Act of this country, where there was a federal act that targeted a specific uh, national group and uh, drastically reduced um, the immigration um, from China. This uh, went on from the late 19th century until well after World War II. Um, and so Chinatown is the way it is. Um, so that's important to remember in the back of your minds when sometimes people ask, well, your developments are, you know, do you give preference to Asian people? You know, are you able to jump the line? Do you not welcome, you know, people who are non, of non-Asian descent? And um, to be very clear, we all have to abide by fair housing laws. There is no, you know, you cannot pick the residents who get to live in the buildings because of their ethnicity or nationalities or race. But um, because it has historically been a uh, ethnic and cultural neighborhood, um, there are more people who want to apply to get into the housing. Um, and so as a result, we make sure that we, you know, whether it's property management staff or our resident engagement staff, we actually have people who have la those language skills and um, cultural competency to be able to um, interact um, in a culturally sensitive way um, with our populations. I think this is a, a challenging question to answer because on both sides of the, um, you know, on one, one example, you know, an artist's building, um, at least within the city of Boston, um, is, is supported by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, which has an artist certification program. And uh, in submitting your portfolio and demonstration that you're, you're exhibiting or showing your work or performing your work in some way that, that benefits the, the cultural community of Boston, you receive a letter or a certificate that then makes you eligible to, to lease artist housing in the city of Boston. And the projects that we're involved in participate in that program. And part of that is because um, it's very good to have a third party making those decisions about who is and who is not an artist. Um, but it isn't so much to define really who is not an artist as much as to elevate people who are uh, working as artists for the betterment of the cultural identity of all of Boston and to make sure that those people continue to have a home here. Um, for a very complex set of reasons, um, you know, it's very difficult to be an artist operating in an urban center in many uh, cases in the way that it is difficult to be uh, many, uh, you know, many, many different types of people who are supported by affordable housing, supported by housing generally that is, that is specific to um, a particular group, um, those are usually reactions to some other um, uh, act of displacement. 
And in the case of Fort Point, there were 600 artists living there who all lived in um, various warehouses and wool warehouses. And when the property owners who owned those buildings sold all of those buildings uh, virtually overnight, and they were bought by, um, by development companies with the idea of developing them, uh, those artists lost their places to work and their homes. And so the Artist Space Initiative was an attempt to try to reverse a lot of what was lost in that context. I think we've all touched a little bit uh, on gentrification, which by definition is a change in a neighborhood where a more affluent um, group moves in um, or more affluent businesses move into a neighborhood. And that's, uh, sometimes that results in displacement of people who have already been living in a neighborhood, but sometimes it's just a change in an area that may have been industrial or underdeveloped so here in Boston, I think we have a lot of examples of both displacement and just gentrification, certainly in South Boston, where I live and work. Um, parts of the South Boston waterfront were undeveloped parking lots, and now they are high-rise buildings and a whole new part of the neighborhood. And I think in the kinds of housing that we've all talked about tonight, um, I don't know if you want to add anything else about how you work to prevent gentrification or how we can all work together to prevent gentrification or more displacement rather than gentrification. If you want to talk a little bit about the benefits of how neighborhoods have changed um, because certainly as Angie's alluded to having higher income um, developments being built in a neighborhood can also generate resources that you may not have had before and in Boston in buildings that are more than 10 units, the city requires 13% of the units on site to be affordable income restricted housing. I mean, I think one of the things that's important is to remember that it isn't an either or, it can be a yes and in most situations. I know that within the artist community, um, we feel very passionately about advocating for affordable housing generally, and also being, to the extent possible, very sensitive to making sure that um, all of the IDP units, for example, are not soaked up by uh, you know, one single project or uh, making sure that there's a healthy mix. And I, th I think generally what people um, have at least expressed to me what they're interested in is, is trying to establish and trying to have, and this is reflected in D&D's inclusionary development policy and the city's inclusionary development policy generally, to have a healthy mix of places where people can not only live but also affordable places where people can uh, shop because this is one of the challenges of developing affordable housing in neighborhoods that are otherwise very affluent is that there aren't very many places that are part of the public realm to be able to go and enjoy a meal for less than a certain amount of money if the neighborhood generally is very uh, very affluent neighborhood. So I think that um, I think that establishing that mix is is critical towards upward mobility, but being sensitive to the legacy of people who have made contributions in the past is, is really what um, is important towards making sure that, that displacement doesn't occur. Um, I think our organization actually has interesting and, and unique perspective on this because although up to this point I have only talked about our work in Boston Chinatown, we actually have done work in Quincy and Malden as well because uh, there are actually growing Asian American communities in both of those towns. And I like to uh, push you to think about gentrification as not a standalone problem that, oh, that's a city of Boston problem, that's a Somerville problem, that's a Cambridge problem. In fact, gentrification and displacement, it's all linked together with the much larger housing crisis that this region and this state um, is facing. And so I, don't, I, I challenge people not to be complacent and think that, oh, well, our communities don't have that problem because in other communities that are surrounding outside of Boston, okay, places that we work in, in Malden and Quincy, believe it or not, if they are not doing their part on making sure that their residents have safe and affordable places to be able to stay, one day people will wake up and say, 
boy, um, our people can no longer afford to stay in their communities. We have been hearing this in Quincy and Malden, but I think within those communities, there is a sense of, well, that's really a Seaport, you know, South Boston problem, and we don't have that problem here. So I just want to challenge that. I think uh, I, I mentioned when I uh, introduced myself that uh, that I was reacting to luxury condo tower construction in Boston because I, I don't think that that serves a stable, well-connected community uh, of people, and. So uh, the whole reason that I, I sought out uh, co-housing as a way to, to, to live and to build community is to create a, a stable community that stays in the location, that, that is a community of people who live near each other, who are neighbors, who know each other and have agreed to um, mutually support each other. If um, you are older and widowed in or have a scary medical appointment, you, 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 your online buddy in Arizona is not gonna accompany you to the doctor to be your second set of ears. Or if you have a sudden um, parent-teacher meeting or you wanna have a date night or go to a public hearing and you need someone to watch the kids, like those uh, neighborhood connections are, have to be created deliberately. And uh, in, in a process of, of starting with a community of people to engage in a process. And I, I mean, I'll admit, it can be a lengthy and expensive process to build a co-housing community. Once they've been built, people stay there for a long time. Um, well, they, they generally stay there un, until the end of their time. And um, the turnover is very uh, infrequent, and they become very strong, rooted places within their community. Um, and I, I see that as a, a, a challenge to um, kind of commercial for-profit development that, that really fosters a more um, transient fly-by-night kind of uh, turnover of, of places that really people need because they need to live there. Okay. I think it's getting a little dark and uh, we're probably about ready to wrap up soon. I want to thank the three panelists and thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, you know, the, we've talked a lot about some challenges in developing housing and maintaining a sense of community. And I think we've also talked a lot about successes that we've all experienced and challenging all of us as the larger community, both here in Massachusetts and nationally around the issue of housing and how do we provide enough housing for those who need it. Um, so I think in Massachusetts, if you're from here, one of the things that is key right now is the Baker administration is proposing a housing choice initiative and it's before the legislature and it provides incentives to cities and towns technical assistance and grants to cities and towns and it asks of those cities and towns that they change the requirement for making a zoning change from a two-thirds majority of the planning commission or town meeting to a simple majority and I think because we've experienced in Boston um, and in, uh, in Malden and other places that there can be major opposition to housing or new development, affordable housing in particular, um, it can often be in a community, especially when it's small town, town meeting, uh, without the kind of strong leadership we've had in Boston and Cambridge and Somerville, uh, that one or two people can torpedo a project and cause delays. And in this kind of development, real estate development, Time truly is money, and whenever projects get delayed over and over again, the cost of that development goes up, and the cost to provide that housing goes up. So this change, the Housing Choice Initiative that Baker is proposing, will, again, make it easier for projects to get approval at the local level. It doesn't take away local control, but it mitigates that what can be a very challenging process in a democracy to get people to come to agreement on the development of a project. So I think that's something that we can, uh, that we can all work towards here in Massachusetts. And then I think the other strategies 
for increasing the supply of housing are in a situation where there is displacement on the horizon because of gentrification, that we try and protect tenants through tenant protection laws. We try and produce more housing and we try and preserve what we have. And one of the ways to do that is to get control of the land and the buildings. And so nonprofits like Asian CDC and South Boston NDC will purchase land and buildings, or there are community land trusts that will, pro will protect properties from the private market so that they can be preserved for the people who are living in them and the rents can be maintained at a moderate level or an affordable level over a long period of time. And that allows that kind of long-term tenancy and establishment of community so that people aren't continually displaced and moving from place to place and struggling just to get by every day and don't have that chance to really form strong neighborhoods and strong communities. So I think those are the things that we are seeing. Um, Somerville right now, for example, has a strategy to do that as the green line expands to Somerville. Um, the city has consciously encouraged and provided funding for the nonprofit there to buy existing triple deckers and other residential properties so that it preserves that affordability. So I hope we leave everyone with some hopeful messages and I'd like to open it up to questions. My preference would be for um, the allowance of higher density um, because I think that land is scarce. Um, you use fewer resources if you occupy a smaller footprint on the land. Um, it's, it, is, it is a pathway out of, of uh, eating up all of our available space with, uh, with sprawl and so I would like to see that. Um, I'm very excited about the, um, the governor's bill to um, allow local communities to um, make those kind of zoning changes with uh, smaller majorities on, on the boards. I generally second that. And just to expand on that, I mean, Massachusetts, um, we have 351 towns and cities and 351 sets of different zoning regulations. And there is a strong uh, tradition of local control. Um, and uh, if anything, what I would like to see, um, you know, hopefully with uh, the passing of the Housing Choice Bill is that all the towns and cities um, can work together um, toward the greater good for the commonwealth by um, making their zoning changes more in sync with smart growth principles. So for example, more density, but where density makes sense. So for example, clustered around you know, transit nodes, amenities, and access um, so that, you know, um, open space and green space and farmland is not just uh, indiscriminately eaten up by um, ridiculous uh, minimum lot sizes. Um, recently, we have seen actually in Malden where they were going against smart growth principles by increasing their parking room requirement. Um, the one parking space per one bedroom is not a smart growth planning principle. Um, I think I agree with everything that's been said, and I also um, would just like to see more creativity around zoning generally, particularly in abutting of industrial sites. Um, I think that there are all kinds of opportunities on industrial site perimeters to have um, very carefully designed um, mixed use uh, and multifamily housing, particularly as it relates to work, live housing, because um, you know, if you're looking at some of the typologies that we've developed and designed, you could have an entire building that is abutting an industrial site, and you could have the entire work segment of the building abutting the industrial site, and that could be very effectively used as a buffer to develop a site that otherwise couldn't be developed for residential use. And so through the, the, the 
kind of creativity of that zoning, um, you could change the character of, a, of an industrial neighborhood to be something that uh, could be both affordable but also quite practical and useful. You mentioned a number of different things. Um, how do people hear, which are all good ideas, but how do people hear or watching on uh, watching the program later participate? How do they get their voices heard? How do they help support moving some of these forwards to dr actually drive the change? There are, at least in Boston, there are community meetings around every large project. And there's always a comment period, and that's a very specific thing. So the comment period, you send in comments to the Boston Planning and Development Agency and express your support or concerns that you may have. And it's often at community meetings that the people who ha are the most negative are the ones that show up and speak. So that letter um, to the BPDA in Boston carries a lot of weight if it's a letter in support. Uh, and the other is we all have elected officials, so vote, you know, let your elected officials know that you support the Housing Choice Initiative, let them know that you support a zoning change in your own community that would enable a higher density development or, or, or that you agree that maybe there is not a need for one parking spot per bedroom in a development because parking is super expensive when you're trying to develop housing. So I, I think those are some of the things, if, if any of the panelists want to add to that. Um. I, I just want to add that I, I totally agree with Donna about, I mean, I think generally speaking, people you know, sometimes go to a meeting when they have a complaint to raise. And so you can't underestimate the value of expressing uh, support for the things that are aligned with your values. Um, and I actually think that that also goes for people working within the administrations. I mean, I think there are a lot of people doing great work at the Department of Neighborhood Development. Um, you know, we've had a very good relationship with, with uh, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture and the BPDA. Um, and so even expressing to those individuals who are working within these large bureaucracies individual specific support in a letter of thanks or just a, you know, in a small gesture can really renew their uh, their faith because a lot of people who are working in government are tr attracted to working, um, especially in these municipalities, they're attracted to that because they want to make a, a difference, they want to make a positive impact on their community. But that sense of uh, commitment has to be renewed um, and that is you know, a very easy thing to do is to send a letter to, to someone working within uh, you know, bureaucracy saying, hey, you know, thank you very much for, for seeing this through and thank you for your support and thank you even for for if it didn't happen, thank you for your, your committed efforts because uh, we have to keep good, capable people working both at the elected level but also within the organizations that really um, you know, get the, the, the job done at the Department of Labor Development and others. So, so what, what role in your community does community play in encouraging individuals to become an activist? Um, I mean, I think community is, is you know, this perhaps a bit hyperbolic, but it's almost everything relative to being active uh, as someone within, within uh, you know, city or even a small town. Um, because people are uh, very excited about doing things that support uh, their friends and their neighbors and the people who they care about, the people that they interact with on a, on a daily basis. But also, um, being a part of a community allows you to examine the most extreme aspects of your own views and to perhaps temper those a little bit uh, towards the pragmatism of the group, um, but also really can act as a real motivator uh, to, to get something done or to, to, uh, to bring something to closure. Um, so I think that uh, a huge part of civic engagement is driven by community, and I agree with the other panelists in terms of this sort of cellularization of apartment buildings and things like that that actually inhibit the growth and the development of community acts to, um, to, uh, to undermine the ability of people to coalesce around shared ideas or principles or things that they would like to further. Um, and so when that community or that communication isn't there, it's very hard to get those ideas off the ground. But uh, I think you know, everyone here has been, you know, benefits to be working within a community and you know how much having the support of your community can change uh, the ability to, to, uh, to, to make things better. Yeah, I, I would echo that sentiment. I mean, um, you know, the 
in addition to providing the housing, making sure that through the fiscal design and operations that we try to foster a sense of community, we also actively do that through our programming. So whether it's things like um, the community garden, the collaborative co collaboration between local artists and residents to do some temporary activations of projects. Um, through those programs, what we have found really interesting is that um, not only do those residents, they, they get to meet each other and build relationships, so you know they become friends, you get to know your neighbors, but through that process, both residents and old, old residents and new residents, they, they start identifying issues that maybe there were issues that previously they thought they were powerless to do anything about. And in our community, we're talking about you know, um, an immigrant population, a lot of um, first generation immigrants who may not speak English well, um, traditionally very underrepresented in the civic engagement process, whether you're talking about voter turnout or showing up at planning zoning meetings. And so through that process, um, there's actually a renewed sense of, oh yeah, we can actually do something. So even something as small as converting that vacant lot on Hudson Street into a garden and they're growing things together, they're starting to identify other problems. For example, you know, uh, trash dumping on that block um, or um, things like not enough open space. And there's now a sense of they can actually do something. So we actually provide a lot of programming and support in response to that and, and, and say, you know, here's what you can do. You can go to these um, community meetings or, you know, here's your um, local war counselor. Um, the, this is when they have coffee hours. You can have a conversation about how you can affect change in your own community. Yeah, the, the theme of community and courage that that Erin mentioned, uh, for, for me personally, um, being part of a community that is trying to do something as audacious as building uh, 30 residential housing units with our own life savings, um, that's a, a thing that I would, I would not do that on my own. But having a, a group of people who five years ago didn't know each other and now have been, been working together um, to make this happen and have, have turned out at, at public hearings. Um, we've brought 20 people to a planning board meeting, getting up one after the other to speak in support of something and attracted neighbors who are not part of our project to get up and speak in support of us. And, that, and I've seen the, the effect of that on uh, the, the uh, city government and the, the people who work in, in the public agencies. Um, give them that uh, feedback um, is, is tremendously powerful. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you again for coming out on this warm evening, and thank you for Old North for hosting us tonight. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.